Hi there, my name is Amanda McFarlane, and I'm the director of the Texas A&M Agriculture Food and Nutrition Evidence Center located in Fort Worth. And I wanted to thank the organizers for having me here today to talk to you about all of the research that went into the implementation of mandatory folic acid fortification for this seminar series. Um, you'll note that all the examples I give are Canadian. However, a lot of the research that was used for developing the policy in Canada was the same as that uh, for developing the similar policy here in the US. I'll quickly uh, pass through my disclosures and then I'll jump right into the topic at hand. So the reason that we have mandatory folic acid fortification is to address a very common birth defect, common, however severe. Um, these birth defects are a suite of defects known as neural tube defects, and they come along with significant morbidity and mortality. You may be familiar with spina bifida, um, which is the most common form of these neural tube defects, and um, it is compatible with life. However, it comes along with paralysis below where the spina bifida um, happened, where the neural tube failed to close. However, there are other significant forms of neural tube defects that are not compatible with life, such as anencephaly, and that's where the neural tube doesn't close over where the brain will be, and then the brain does not form um, correctly. Now, before we had fortification in Canada, we had a fairly high uh, NTD prevalence. Um, if you looked just overall at neural tube defects, we had about 1.58 per 1,000 births. But what was interesting is we had a very significant east-west gradient. So on the west coast in British Columbia, we had a fairly low neural tube defect prevalence. But as you move to the east coast around Newfoundland and Labrador, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, they had quite significant prevalence of NTDs. And there was a real large question here about, is this due to differences in genetics in those populations? or is it differences in lifestyle, diet, and those kinds of things. But at the time it was unknown. Now in the 70s and 80s, there were a number of observational studies that came out. So these are pregnancy cohorts. And what they found was that um, women who had lower folate status were more likely to have um, an NTD affected pregnancy. And so this kind of triggered people's thinking about, well, maybe there's a relationship between folic acid and NTD. Now, in order to show a causal relationship between folic acid and NTD um, was you have to do a randomized controlled trial. And in 1991, the MRC trial was published and this was looking at NTD recurrence. So there is a, um, a genetic component and so uh, the women who participated in this trial had had a previous NTD affected pregnancy, so they were considered higher risk. There was almost 2000 women um, participants and it was a controlled trial where you had, um, the intervention was four milligrams of folic acid per day or placebo. And they found very clearly a 72% reduction in NTDs. Now that's in a high risk population. There was a, a second clinical trial that was um, proceeded and this was looking at primary occurrence, um, preventing the primary occurrence of NTDs. And this is interesting because this is, the study recruited basically women that did not have a previous pregnancy affected by an NTD. And so they would, were part of the generally healthy population. It was published in 1992. It, took place in Hungary, so it's referred to as the Hungarian trial. It had almost 5,000 births. And of course, you have to have that many participants uh, for a trial like this, because even though NTDs are common um, for a birth defect, they are not particularly common across the population. In this trial, the uh, intervention dose of folic acid was 0.8 milligrams per day. And what they found in this trial was that there was an even greater reduction in NTDs. It was over 90%. And I'll take a pause here just to state that in nutrition, the fact that we have these clinical trials examining a hard clinical endpoint and see this causal relationship is fairly rare. We tend to need to rely on RCTs that use surrogate endpoints rather than a clinical endpoint. Um, and 
of complemented with prospective cohorts where you're looking at associations between intake of a particular nutrient and a hard clinical outcome. So this is kind of the cream of the crop. You've got the data that really shows there's this causal relationship between folic acid intake and neural tube defect prevention. So you would think that the recommendation and any policy that comes from this evidence is just give women folic acid and then you can prevent all the NTDs or most of the NTDs, all of the ones that are folic acid responsive. But of course, it's never that simple. So there was consideration about what options there were for increasing folic acid intake among women of childbearing age. So the first option is you just change dietary guidance. You recommend that people consume foods that are naturally rich in folate that will increase their folate intake and should improve their folate status and thereby reduce their NTD risk. The other option is to uh, recommend folic acid supplement use for those individuals who are planning to become pregnant or could become pregnant. Um, and then there's the other option of folic acid food fortification. So this is where you have fortification of the food supply, um, but whereas you have a target population of those people who could become pregnant, but you're actually targeting the entire population at the same time. So there are strengths and limitations for all of these approaches, and that had to be considered as the policy was being developed. And the reality is, it's, and it's the same as it is now, as it was back in the day, um, that we have inadequate dietary folate in pregnancy. So this is just one example of many. This is a study that I was involved in called the FACT um, trial. It was a folic acid clinical trial looking at prevention of preeclampsia in um, women at risk for preeclampsia. And when we looked at dietary folate intake among these participants, we found that over or less than 70% um, met the estimated average requirement for pregnancy. So that's a big chunk of your population is not getting enough folate or folic acid in their diet alone. But the issue with making dietary recommendations is not all folates are equal. And so there was a study that came out of Ireland. Ireland is a real powerhouse in this area. And what they found is if you intervened in participants, and had them take a supplement or fortified foods or recommended dietary interventions where they increase their dietary folate, you could increase their folate intake, which is in the, um, the top graph. So folate is increased, whether it's through supplements, fortified foods, or dietary folate. However, when you actually looked at changes in folate status, which is what you need, you need the, that mom's folate status to change, it was really only changing when you had higher folic acid intake through supplements and fortified foods. The dietary folate, that naturally occurring folate, really had minimal impact on status biomarkers. And this is probably because of increased bioavailability of folic acid compared to naturally occurring um, folates, but it really made the emphasis that dietary guidance alone was not going to get you where you needed to be. So then, of course, we also recommend that um, people who could become pregnant uh, consume folic acid. And so ideally, you want folic acid to be consumed in the periconceptional period. And so Health Canada, for instance, and this is the same as in the States, in addition to consuming a healthy diet that is folate rich, anyone who could become pregnant should consume a daily multivitamin that contains 400 micrograms of folic acid. But timing is critical. So that neural tube closing, that actually happens before most people know they're pregnant. And that's because it closes in about 23 to 26 days post-conception. So if you're not planning on becoming pregnant, you may not be consuming folic acid because it may not be top of mind. And we know that the reality is that 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. And so it's you can't assume that people, you know, who could possibly become pregnant will be planning to take their folic acid because they may become pregnant. 
Um, and so that leaves about 50% of pregnancies at risk of not consuming folic acid in that early periconceptional period. And we know that this public health promotion does not reach everyone. So a survey a while ago now, but a survey suggested that close to 30% of women took folic acid in the periconceptional period. So that means there's a lot of women who were not taking folic acid in the periconceptional period. And who are those individuals? Well, they tend to be younger, they tend to be lower socioeconomic status. Um, and the reasons they gave for not consuming folic acid is often lack of knowledge that it's important for um, your fetal development. Um, and then of course, unplanned pregnancy was a risk factor for not consuming folic acid in the periconceptional period. So this leaves us with fortification, that third option. But because we're going to be targeting the whole population, not just the target population, there needed to be an assessment of how much folic acid is needed to increase folate status and minimize NTD risk without overexposing the population to high doses of it, high and potentially unnecessary. So when we think about a population health approach, we need to think about population folate status and what is the status required uh, for reducing neural tube defect risk. And this has been modeled and confirmed in a few different studies that the optimal red blood cell folate concentration in populations is about, about 900 nanomoles per liter. And so if someone is going in and planning a pregnancy, their physician may actually test their red blood cell folate levels to make sure that they have enough. Um, we know the intake of folic acid that's required to achieve that 900 nanomoles per liter, and it's about 350 micrograms per folic acid, which aligns quite well with that 400 microgram folic acid recommendation that Health Canada has. And so it's really important that we identify a safe and effective dose to achieve that status. Um, so this is um, one of the original papers published in 1995 in, in the lead up to the development of these fortification policies. This is written by a group from the FDA. And in there, they specifically talk about, we need to have the lower the effective dose the lower the risk of exposure to high doses in some people. Because again, this is targeting the whole population, not just your, your population of interest, which are people who could become pregnant. And so they did modeling to look at intakes, um, looking at percent of the um, daily intake and the strike bars are current intakes. And then if it was increased by 140 or 350 micrograms of folic acid per day, these are doses that were being proposed um, for fortification. And you can see that um, you start having quite a few people start reaching high levels, especially if they're at 350 microgram dose. And so the US, for instance, ended up going with 140 micrograms of folic acid per day or, or uh, per 100 grams of uh, white flour versus the 350, so that pe all people would get more but not excessive amounts more. And in Canada, we ended up going with 150 micrograms per 100 grams of uh, cereal grain products. We also know that baseline status of your population impacts the dose required for risk reduction. And this is important. So obviously, if there are people with good folate status already, maybe they consume a supplement, maybe they have a good diet, um, they probably don't need a lot more supplement to increase their status above that 900 nanomoles per liter cutoff. Um, but studies looking specifically at women with initial low red cell folate, you can see that the estimated risk reduction for NTDs is quite a bit higher in that group. And so baseline status matters. And we know that in fortification, for instance, the baseline status is, is going to be increased. Now, duration of exposure also impacts the achieved status, and this is important as well. So here we're looking at changes in a biomarker called homocysteine. It's a functional indicator of folate status. So when folate status is low, homocysteine is high. 
And as folate status increases, homocysteine goes down. And here you can see they were um, the individuals who are participating in the study were consuming either a placebo, which is this top line, or increasing amounts of folic acid, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8 milligrams. And at six weeks after this exposure, you can see that the high dose got that homocysteine down lower faster. But by the time you reach 26 weeks, there's really no difference. So time matters. So a chronic exposure over a longer period of time, even of a lower dose, can have the same results as a high dose over a short period of time. And again, this is more like what fortification is. We know that it's a chronic exposure. People are going to be consuming a little bit of folic acid every day. Um, and so maybe you don't need as high a dose to achieve the status. And so you can do a, uh, a lot with a little bit. And based on this, um, mandatory fortification was put forward uh, by Health Canada. And there were some other policy considerations. So we have a general policy on food fortification. This aligns with the Codex Alimentarius, which is the WHO um, guidelines for making policies. And this is to prevent or correct a demonstrated deficiency of the nutrient in specific groups of the population. And this aligns with what folic acid fortification was doing. We had a specific group that would benefit from this fortification. The goal was also to fortify a food staple. So it was white flour. And the reason that you do that is because it should reach the target population because most people will be consuming it and it requires very little change to dietary pattern. And it's also eases monitoring of intake. So if you're only uh, fortifying a single food stuff um, and you have a good idea of what the consumption of that food stuff is, then you can monitor the intake. And then in 1998, there was also a, a release of the new folate dietary reference intakes. This is a nutrient reference value for folate. And it was actually increased over the last values. So the estimated average requirement um, was increased for the general population. So we knew that by increasing folic acid intake through fortification, you would be achieving um, this higher recommended intake. And then of course, in Canada, it requires harmonization with the US. So there's always trade impl um, implications. Um, you don't normally like to think about this in terms of health policy, but it is the reality. Uh, because of the North American Free Trade Agreement at the time, we had a common marketplace. And so there was um, trade implications if the U.S. decided to fortify and Canada didn't. And so with all that being said, the regulations were amended in 1998 and white wheat flour was the main staple food that was fortified. Um, at, like I said, it was 150 micrograms per 100 grams of flour but we also did enriched pasta as well. And so it's tied up in a neat bow, you would think, except for policy should never be considered a fait accompli. So ideally when you have a policy, especially a policy that targets the general population, it should be reviewed and it should be reflected upon over time to ensure that it's meeting its intended goals and we are not having unanticipated outcomes, negative outcomes potentially. Um, they need to be identified. So what's the first thing we wanted to look at? Well, the goal was to reduce neural tube defect prevalence in Canada. And so was that actually achieved? And it was. This has been a huge public health success story, probably one of, one of the best stories we have um, in Canada. And so what we found was that the neural tube defect prevalence decreased significantly across the country. And in fact, on that East Coast where we had the highest rates, they fell down to background levels equivalent to that on the West Coast. So it really was diet, had nothing to do with genetics or other lifestyle factors. It was simply that they were having enough folate in their diet. And there was a 45% risk reduction in NTD prevalence. So that's really an amazing success. So the next thing we wanted to do, and this was done in uh, the 2000s, was to actually look at folate status in the population after fortification was implemented. 
the majority of those who could become pregnant are reaching that 900 nanomoles per liter cutoff. So that's great. 78% of women are reaching that cutoff. What we did find was individuals who are not supplement consumers. So these are the people not taking a folic acid supplement. 25% of those individuals are not making that cutoff. And their intakes are also below that estimated average requirement. And again, like previously seen in surveys, those individuals tended to be younger, they tended to be lower socioeconomic status. What's interesting, however, so we've got some people not meeting the cutoff, we've got the majority meeting the cutoff, but when you look at those people who are at least meeting the cutoff, you actually have a significant proportion of the population, over 50%, that are actually can have a status indicative of potentially excessive intakes of folate. So, and supplement use was a determinant of high status in that group. And those were people who were not pregnant, but could become pregnant. We have data as well from Canadian pregnancy cohorts. And what we find is that in the first trimester of pregnancy, individuals have very high folate status. And that's even among those who are not consuming um, recommended doses of folic acid have high, um, quite high status. So we have few below the plasma cutoff. So this is now looking at plasma folate, but we have an analogous cutoff for that. So few individuals were below the plasma cutoff for NTD risk reduction, even among the lower supplement doses. So the Canadian population is a little unique in the world. It is a highly exposed population. And so it begs the question, do we still need supplements? Because we have fortification and clearly among those individuals with the lower folic acid supplement intake, you still have fairly high status. So we, do we still need to make that recommendation? And the reality is, is that we do. And this goes back to that data that I showed earlier where dietary intake in pregnancy just isn't enough to ensure adequacy. So we've got 70% of individuals who were not consuming the estimated average requirement for pregnancy if they were not taking supplements. And then again, kind of aligning with the folate status indicators, we have individuals who are consuming supplements are almost all um, consuming folic acid intakes above the tolerable upper intake level. So this is the, the level above which usual intakes um, may be associated with adverse effects. So you don't want that. However, we found that 90% of these pregnancy cohort participants were consuming over the well if they're consuming a, fo a folic acid supplement. So this kind of begs the question, why does Canada in particular have such high exposure? Why can't we hit that sweet spot? And the reality is, is because we have some policies that are at odds with the reality of what's available in the marketplace. So we know that among those low risk individuals, people who don't have a personal history of a neural tube defect or haven't had a pregnancy affected by a tube defect, we're recommending that they consume 0.4 milligrams of folic acid a day, in addition to what they're getting from diet. And then in Canada, we also have a couple of other risk de definitions. So we have moderate risk individuals who are recommended to take one milligram. These are individuals who are at higher risk of neural tube defects um, because of epilepsy or diabetes or some other clinical risk factors. And then there are those high risk individuals who are recommended for four milligrams per day. And those are those individuals who've had a previously affected pregnancy or family history, et cetera. But when you look at the folic acid content of supplements that are available on the market, it doesn't align. So regular daily multivitamins will often have 0.4 to 0.6 milligrams. The prenatal multivitamins in Canada almost exclusively have one milligram. So you're already over double, two and a half times what you need um, if you're a low risk individual. And then the prescription multivitamins don't even have just four milligrams per day, they actually have five. And so we have this misalignment between 
the folic acid uh, multivitamins that are actually available based relative to the recommendations that we're making. And so basically consumers in Canada can't actually meet the recommendations. We also have a lot of inconsistent recommendations as to who in Canada is actually at risk. Um, and so we've had a number of changes over the years. In 2007, the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists really opened up the recommendation that virtually every person in Canada would warrant um, that high risk dose, that high five milligram dose. And that's because they decided, um, they recommended that people with high BMI, people of certain ethnicity groups. Um, and my personal favorite was if a physician thought that their patient might be at risk of not consuming their folic acid regularly, that they should just take a high dose. And so that really opened up um, prescribing habits of physicians. And you now have a lot of um, people going to their physician and actually being prescribed five milligrams. Now in 2015, that changed. It was kind of brought back down to, um, you know, low risk individuals should have 400 micrograms, but that those prescribing habits don't change quickly. Um, they get established and they don't change. Now Canada is not unique to this. So we've got a lot of different risk recommendations or risk definitions, whether you're, you're in the UK, um, in the US or the WHO, those risk definitions for those people who should take high folic acid um, is really inconsistent. And they range from if someone has a seizure disorder they, um, or taking certain medications, their personal or partner has an NTD, if they have a personal or partner family history, if they have diabetes, if they have high BMI, if they're using folate inhibiting drugs, they have intestinal malabsorption condition. There's a laundry list of conditions that may fall under one of these high risk um, definitions who would then be prescribed a five milligram dose. And again, in the context of folic acid fortification, um, this may or may not be necessary. Now, all of this begs the question, is high folic acid actually a bad thing? Because if it's not a bad thing, then it doesn't matter if everyone's getting more. And there is there's one side of the population who really feels that folic acid, folate, it's a water soluble uh, B vitamin, you're just gonna pee it out, it's not a bad thing. However, there have been concerns raised that high folic acid may actually be problematic. Now, I will say the data is not consistent, but there are red flags here um, and it's caused some angst in the um, healthcare community. So there's preclinical animal studies and observational studies. So looking at associations in people that have identified possible adverse outcomes associated with folic acid exposure above the UL um, or elevated folate status. Um, this includes a potential negative interaction between elevated folate status and vitamin B12 metabolism. So those two nutrients are actually interrelated in terms of their metabolism. And there's um, been some suggestion that there may be adverse effects on biomarkers of vitamin B12 deficiency when people are consuming high doses of folic acid. There may be neurocognitive decline among the elderly who are B12 deficient to consuming high doses of folic acid. And there's been some concern that um, folic acid um, can actually promote cancer. So folate's required for, for things like DNA synthesis and cancer cells require a lot high rates of DNA synthesis. And so there's some concern that it actually promotes the growth of cancer. There have been associations with cardiovascular disease risks, diabetes and metabolic syndrome, um, insulin resistance and obesity in the offspring, um, autism kind of on the fence. Um, and then in rodent studies, at least, there were actually adverse birth outcomes associated with high dose folic acid. And so again, I don't wanna be alarmist, the data is very heterogeneous and there's a lot of inconsistency and there's as many studies that show no or beneficial effect as there are with it, that there's an adverse effect. But again, as policymakers, we have to be looking for these red flags and pursue those to make sure that we're not having any unintended consequences. Related to this, 
the National Toxicology Program in um, in uh, collaboration with the NIH Office of Dietary Supplements in 2015 hosted a workshop looking at identifying research needs for assessing safe use of high, pol high intakes of folic acid. So it was really um, an exercise in exploring some of these um, observations that had been made that there may be potential adverse effects. And I mean, importantly, there was no high level evidence for adverse effects of high dose folic acid. But like I mentioned, there were some signals identified through this workshop that there was a need for research to assess these associations of high folic acid intake with cancer and these interactions with low vitamin B12 status. And following on that, in 2019, um, there was an, a second NIH workshop looking at the metabolic interactions between folic acid excess and vitamin B12 deficiency, looking to identify some of those research gaps. And so this is an active area of research and of interest for policymakers. What is missing and what was identified through those previous workshop activities was that we really have no indicator of adverse effects associated with folic acid intakes. So it's, when you take really high doses of folic acid, it's not like it causes a consistent toxicity, for instance. Um, and so we have no established indicators for these direct adverse effects. I mentioned that we have a tolerable upper intake level, a like UL for folate. Um, it's specific to folate that's added to supplements and enriched fortified foods such as folic acid, um, and it's in relation to that potential for um, exacerbating neuropathy that's associated with vitamin B12 deficiency. So it's it's kind of a, a B12-dependent outcome, but it's through um, potential relationship with folate. So it's not a direct adverse effect. With those rodent studies that I mentioned, so you had that kind of alarming um, to be honest, um, observation where high dose folic acid in some rodent models was causing um, embryo defects. That's alarming because your target population is is um, people who can become pregnant. Uh, but we don't actually understand very well the relationship between rodent intakes and human intakes. So are those intakes that were in those studies kind of proof of principle, really high, super physiological, or are they comparable at all to the human intakes? And we don't know. So one indicator of at least high exposure is unmetabolized folic acid or UMFA. Um, it's been hypothesized to be a causal factor underpinning some of these observed associations with adverse health outcomes, again, inconsistently. Um, but whether it's causally related to adverse health effects or not, it has been proposed to be an indicator of super physiological excess. Um, of folic acid intake. And the reason is because once you have folic acid consumption of above about 200 micrograms per day, um, you will start seeing unmetabolized folic acid in circulation because it overwhelms the ability of the liver to metabolize it to those um, reduced naturally occurring folates. And when we look at our pregnancy population in Canada, we have you, unmetabolized folic acid is ubiquitous. So virtually all samples will have unmetabolized folic acid. And when we break down this cohort um, of about 1500 um, participants in the first trimester, you can see that folic acid is in circulation and is representing up to 19% of the total folate in circulation. And that's quite high compared to the general population who is just consuming folic acid through fortification. Total, um, unmetabolized folic acid is usually about less than 5%. So it does really take a jump in these um, uh, pregnant Canadians, and especially among those who are consuming these uh, fairly high doses above 1,000 micrograms, which is, as mentioned, above what is recommended. So is could there be an alternative to folic acid? This has come up. Um, there are a lot of messages in the media that actually natural folate is an alternative for reducing NTD risk. Um, one of the issues I have with a lot of what's out there in the media is not that natural folate is 
a potential alternative is that people are mythologizing folic acid as actually bad. So this is um, a commentary by a couple of physicians and they actually talk about, um, you know, synthetic folic acid can actually become hazardous. It accumulates um, using active 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. So that's that natural occurring folate um, can bypass a mutated enzyme. So we have a common um, polymorphism in a um, particular gene that's involved in folate metabolism. So they're promoting the idea that folic acid is actually hazardous and that this uh, 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate is, is an alternative to that. But we have to distinguish between fact and fiction. And again, this is what policymakers do. It's like, okay, they're making these statements out in the media. Is what they're saying true? So can 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, that natural quote-unquote folate, improve folate status? And when you're looking at a comparison between equimolar doses of folic acid versus that natural folate, um, after about 16 weeks, they're about the same in terms of their impact on folate status. So absolutely, it still can increase your folate status. Then there was that issue about if you carry this polymorphism, this MTHFR677 C to T, they're saying you can't actually use folic acid and it's not going to increase your status. Um, so the Polymorphism is associated with lower status, but we know that it's still responsive to folic acid. So here, this is a trial that um, was taken on in China, and you've got individuals with the common polymorphism versus their heterozygous for it versus that TT, the one that they say can't use folic acid. And from the beginning until the end of the study, you can see that regardless of genotype, they all have an increase in folate status when they're consuming folic acid. And in fact, even those individuals with the um, homozygous for the polymorphism are able to achieve that 900 nanomoles per liter. So these, so that wasn't actually true. So individuals with that TT polymorphism can absolutely use folic acid to increase their folate status. And one consideration that people don't talk about in the literature is the fact that, as I mentioned, vitamin B12 and folate meta are metabolized in an interrelated fashion. So vitamin B12 is actually required to change that natural folate, 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, to what we call tetrahydrofolate. And that's the bioactive form of folate in the cell. That's what you need to make your DNA. And so if people are deficient for B12, they actually cannot use that 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate to form THF because you require B12 to do that part of the reaction. And so you could actually end up with a, full, a functional folate deficiency because of the B12 deficiency, and that has the potential to even increase NTD risk. So the reality is we don't recommend natural folate as an alternative folic acid. And that's because we the reduced folate might reduce the risk of NTDs. We know it can increase your status, but folic acid does reduce the risk of NTDs. We know it does because we have clinical trials showing that causal relationship. And in fact, it would be unethical to recommend 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate instead of folic acid when we do not know for certain based on gold standard RCTs that it lowers NTD risk. Um, and then, of course, there's that question about for those with vitamin B12 deficiency, could it actually increase their NTD risk? So these are unknowns. And that's why we stick with that folic acid recommendation. So last thing I want to talk about is can we modify folic acid policies to optimize intake and maximize benefit? So we don't want people falling below the recommended intakes or status, but we also don't necessarily want them having excessive folic acid intakes that are unnecessary. We basically just want to target that 900 nanomoles per liter status. And so we've been working on that. So a few years ago now, um, a group of collaborators and I hosted a workshop 
looking specifically at low risk women in Canada, um, trying to align prenatal folic acid supplement composition and intake with current expert guidelines. So the, the, the goal is really, we want optimal folic acid intake. We know what works, we just don't want them to be consuming more than what's needed. And so this workshop um, involved, um, it, was, it was really nice. There was only about 35 people invited. It, there were government, industry reps. Um, we had um, health professionals invited as well as academic researchers. And we had them identify kind of the challenges to um, that are impeding optimal folic acid intake among these low risk individuals. And among them were need for additional evidence on the effective dose and duration, um, supplement content alignment with recommendations. Because like I said, in Canada, almost all of the prenatal vitamins don't have what's recommended. Um, facilitating access to folic acid containing supplements, and then knowledge transfer uh, to, to women and healthcare professionals so that they have the right recommendations. And to start really educating um, and counter, countering this more is better attitude about it. And what's nice is since we had that workshop, we had a couple of um, vitamin supplement companies, they actually re reformulated down after the after this. Um, and then Health Canada, um, I had a an opportunity to develop some labeling that companies could use saying that the recommended dose is 400 micrograms for individuals without any risk factors, um, so that if a company wanted to reformulate down, um, it's not putting them at a disadvantage in the marketplace. And so that's now available to um, industry. So overall, I hope I've shown you that even though we definitely like to have and we'll use them if we have uh, randomized controlled trials, and in terms of folic acid, reducing the risk for NTD risk, like this is the gold standard. We know that there's this causal relationship, but I've shown that there are lots of other study types and different kinds of research that were required and used to inform the policy. And as we're moving forward, there are even more studies that will be required to assess whether the goals are being achieved with no unintended consequences. And a big one is, you know, these animal models um, looking at whether these are plausible mechanisms and then doing more studies, um, carefully examining these interactions between B12 um, status and folic acid. So in summary, we have high certainty evidence, the gold standard evidence that folic acid reduces the risk for NTDs. But we know that timing and dose are important. And that's why in addition to recommending good diet and folic acid containing supplements that we have implemented fortification in Canada and the US and in about 60 other countries around the world. And it's highly successful. Wherever it has been implemented, it has reduced the um, NTD prevalence in those, those countries. But there's room for improvement. So we really need to achieve that Goldilocks folic acid intake, not too much and not too little. We know that fortification increases folate status, but folic acid supplements required um, are, are still required to ensure adequate intake. Um, but ideally, we would have prenatal supplements formulated to ensure that the total folic acid intake is about 0.4 milligrams to ensure that they have an optimal intake without having an excessive intake. And it's Unclear whether high folate status or unmetabolized folic acid in circulation are harmful, um, but in the absence of evidence of additional benefit of these high folate intakes, um, it should be suggested that these high doses are limited to clinical cases, especially in the context of fortification. So in Canada and the US, unless you're an individual who are meeting that risk definition, having had a previous pregnancy that's an NTD, um, or having had an NTD yourself, really let's leave those prescription doses um, for those clinical populations. We also need consensus on what the risk definitions are, because like I said, there's a lot of difference uh, depending on the jurisdiction where you are. And we need to identify indicators of adverse effects, maybe unmetabolized folic acid is that, um, but there's more study needed for that. <clears throat> 
And ideally, folic acid intake should be at the lowest effective and safest dose. That should always be the goal. So with that, I just acknowledge, so I presented a lot of data, some of it's from my lab, um, some of it's from, from other labs, um, other groups. Um, so just to acknowledge members of my lab, uh, the Nutrition Reference Lab at the Canadian Health Measures Survey um, at Health Canada, we have a number of labs in Toronto and Burnaby who help with some of these measurements. The FACT study was in collaboration with Mark Walker and Shi Wu Wen. And the Myrick study was in collaboration with Ty Arbuckle and Bill Fraser. And of course, I'd like to thank the uh, cohort participants and site staff for those studies. Um, and then there's the funding. And before I sign off, I just wanted to, to give a bit of a plug for the Agriculture, Food and Nutrition Evidence Center. So as we're moving forward, um, it's not just the research, but it's how we, we evaluate the research that's becoming more and more important for making policy, making guidelines and recommendations. And so more often, and especially in the health field, but it's broadening across public health, nutrition, and even in environmental studies, um, is really the use of systematic methodologies to perform evidence reviews and synthesis looking at the global state of the evidence and evaluating where there are strengths and limitations as well as gaps that need to be filled. And so at the Agriculture, Food and Nutrition Evidence Center, our bread and butter work is producing state-of-the-art systematic reviews, um, looking at impacts of um, or relative to economic agriculture, human and environmental health outcomes. Um, we also are advancing methodologies related to performing systematic reviews, and then we have a convening role to bring experts together um, to move some of these standards um, and methodologies forward. So that's the work that we do at the Evidence Center, and we'd be happy to talk about that as well. So that's everything from me. I really appreciate your time. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them.